Well, you know, in the early days um, of consoles, uh, the BBC were using uh, what were known as quadrant faders. Uh, these were a handle which was on a, a hinged arc underneath the desk, and uh, the it was a series of 54 contacts. And as your fader was moved up and down, so it made contact with one or other of these little contacts, little brass contacts. And as you moved the fader, it would go tick, 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 electrical ticks. Well, we'd spent a lot of time making really quiet amplifiers and switches and all the rest of it. So I simply um, <laughs> abhorred the idea of putting something into the console which was going to make noises like that. In any case, um, this somehow gave the console a really old-fashioned feel and look. And... Uh, uh, on the continent, there were a couple of manufacturers who were making flat faders, um, and they were not based on the same mechanical design at all. Um, the uh, one was one firm was called Guiling, and the other one was called EMT, if I remember rightly, and. Uh, the Guiling fader was a very nice fader, but not all that reliable. The EMT fader was also a very nice fader. The movement of this fader was on little horizontal ball race, and everything was fine, um, except that every now and then the ball race would fall apart, and you'd get little ball bearings spattering down onto the floor under the console, and fader no longer working. Uh, well, our signature was reliability, and it didn't really matter whether it was our circuit that was not working reliably or whether it was somebody's fader that wasn't working reliably. The customer simply blamed Rupert Neve for an unreliable console if the ball bearings fell out of it, so <laughs> quite reasonably. Um, so I... Um, was trying to buy these faders in quantity, but to a higher specification. The importer of these faders was charging a, a ridiculously high price for them, and um, I thought I could do a deal with him. I went to him and said, look, if you can increase your quality and if you can keep your price down, uh, we'd be prepared to buy some, I forget the quantities that I, but I would be prepared to place a contract for a large number of these faders. So this gentleman was German, and he wasn't having any of that. And he said, who do you think you are, Mr. Neve? You think you can control my pricing and my uh, business? No, I will not do this. Um, if you want to buy more faders, the price will be more, not less. <laughs> so... I said, well, in that case, we don't buy any more of your faders. So how are you going to make your consoles? Well, just about that time, we had been approached by a company in England, or rather it was actually in Wales, who uh, were in the aircraft industry, and they were making um, parts for the aircraft industry, uh, a sort of put in shometer type of effect, an actuator, um, which they said the, um, the, the operating element was actually a conductive plastic. Well, I'm not averse, I'm not uh, even today fully aware of what the difference was between conductive plastic and the old high quality carbon fader. But um, they came and said, we would like to make faders for you. Um, and we have come to the conclusion, we've done a survey, that you are the largest consumer of faders in Europe. And so we want you to tell us what fader we should make and we'll make it for you. Well, I was astonished to find that we were the largest of anything. 
<laughs> we always thought of ourselves as really quite small. And uh, um, <clears throat> we gave them a drawing showing the scale that we wanted the fader to be. Um, and they made one that was reasonably close, but not close enough. And then they eventually got that right after a few further attempts. Um, but when the day came when we had bought, uh, I forget, 50 or so of these, of these faders, but there were no two of the same. That was the, f the first thing. That we found that they, were all, they all had different scales. They could not get consistency in these faders. Um, eventually, um, my chief engineer and I designed a jig which uh, they were able to attach the fader to the jig in the manufacturing process and um, they were able to trim the track so that it conformed to the standards laid down by this jig. Um, well, that was better than nothing, but it still wasn't absolutely right. So my chief engineer and I went down to Wales to see Penny and Giles, find out why they were having such a lot of difficulty in getting consistency between faders. And they said, well, we have undertaken that we will never show anybody how we make these faders. It's a secret. Well, if you want to keep the secret, then you don't supply any more faders to us because we do need these to be consistent. And we're not in the business of revealing your deep and dark secrets to anybody. And the secret can't be much good anyway if it's not producing the right results. So eventually, they they, this was an old uh, mill building, um, deep, dark dungeons. Um, and they took us into one of these dungeons, which was their quality control lab. And there was this gentleman, just the one, who was in charge of quality control. And uh, he had got um, a substrate of um, circuit board material on which there was um, a herringbone pattern of um, uh, fader substrates on this, which the idea was that it would be cut into sections and each sec section would become a fader. Well, in order to get this herringbone to be truly smoothly conductive, um, you had to have, sir, give it a surface of conductive plastic. Um, <clears throat> The way they did this was really astonishing. Um, they had a, a jam jar with black powder in it, and they had a teaspoon. And this old boy who dipped the teaspoon into the jam jar, just shake it around until he had exactly the right amount of powder on this teaspoon. And then he'd go to this substrate plate, and he'd be tapping the teaspoon and tapping the, uh, the powder so that the right amount fell on each one of these fader substrates. And having got them right, or he looked, it looked as if they were right, he then put them under an infrared lamp and cooked them. And he timed it with the watch on his wrist, a nice accurate watch, and um, when it was done, it was done. So then they would split these into different fader, fader sections and start to measure it. Even so, they would find that a number of these were not accurate enough. There was not much they could do about it, except to throw away the ones that were way out of spec. Well, that was the way faders were originally made. And eventually, we provided them with a quality control jig, which meant that they would set this up on an actual fader and move the fader to specified points along the scale where it had to read electrically certain values. And bit by bit, they got this right. Well, you can imagine it was an expensive process. But Penny and Giles, in spite of everything, did a good job. And uh, although we joke about the way in which they did it, 
um, they were the people who emerged ahead of anybody else who was trying to make faders at that time. We did have some problems of a different sort. Um, the wipers, which would move along this uh, uh, the, this uh, substrate of uh, um, uh, of conductive material, um, were soldered. Uh, it was a bunch of little gold wires which were soldered onto a little piece of circuit board, uh, which was in turn attached to the to the knob which moved the the whole thing. And um, <clears throat> we found, unfortunately, the hard way, that bit by bit these little wires would get unsoldered and drop off. And when the last wire had dropped off, of course, the signal disappeared. There was now no circuit in the fader. <laughs> and uh, we had quite a lot of trouble because of that. Um, in one particular case, um, one of the, the big broadcasters in the Midlands called me on a Saturday afternoon at my home and very angry because they were in the middle of their major sports program which went all Saturday afternoon and bang in the middle of it they'd lost the entire program because the master output fader on the console had failed. Well, <laughs> I had to jump in the car and take another fader down and um, fit a new fader while they played records or something to the crowd. So we were expecting a sports program. But within about 25 minutes, we got that console back on air again. But that was Penny and Jar's fault, not my fault. Um, and they, they, these these faders, they looked absolutely perfect. There was no way of telling that they were likely to fail. But bit by bit, they improved the quality, and I haven't heard of anything like that happening for many years now.